So yeah, today's talk is going to be on uh, shamanism. And yes, I'm pronouncing it shamanism <laughs> because normally scholars say shaman and shamanism rather than shaman or shamanism because uh, shamanism with this pronunciation is closer to the original word where the term comes from, which is from the Tungusic language and it is shaman. So <laughs> that's why normally um, scholars in the field pronounce it shamanism rather than shamanism. So just to explain why I'm pronouncing it this way. Is there a question? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I see the, the screen uh, popping in, so I, I'm not sure whether somebody wants to ask something. Uh, so, yeah, um, my, uh, as I was, uh, as per introduction, uh, I'm doing, I'm actually about to finish my PhD in religious studies. And my PhD was focused on uh, shamanism uh, with a field work in Italy. And it was on both transcultural and indigenous forms of shamanism. Um, so I'm really, really fascinated. And I've been studying for uh, quite a few years now, uh, shamanism in the Western world, specifically in Europe, even more specifically in Italy. So yeah, uh, how did, shamanism came to be as um, a system of study as a, a subject and a subject matter of study well shamanism um, basically came from uh, Russian ethnography in the 19th century and to make it very simple and very uh, easy to follow basically it wasn't like shamanism was um, discovered in the 19th to 20th century. It was more like scholars actually um, acknowledged that there were uh, similar patterns across different indigenous shamanisms. And so they gave it a name basically. And at first uh, this name was applied to uh, certain indigenous traditions around uh, Siberia and in Russia. And then later on, more scholars and more anthropologists and ethnographers realized that there were similarities in other places, in places where indigenous people, which is, of course, another um, label that we may <laughs> debate, um, because I, I do kind of uh, challenge that kind of categorization. But yeah, um, basically, uh, scholars came to use the term shamanism to refer not only to Siberian shamanism, but to other traditions which were practiced across the world, mainly by indigenous people. And uh, that's how the term came to be, basically. To, yeah, it, it was basically created by scholars, by academics, to overlap existing local labels. Because um, if you go and see basically what kind of names and what kind of labels and terms uh, indig indigenous people or people who um, are believed to practice shamanism use, these terms tend to be different depending on the place. Every place has their own term for their shaman and every place has their specific term for shamanism or that kind of vernacular healing or those kinds of practices. So this is how the category of shamanism came to be. Now let's move on to how shamanism came to the Western world, to the United States first and to Europe uh, after that. Basically, it all started with the works by Carlos Castaneda, and Carlos Castaneda was also a PhD candidate at the UCLA uh, in Los Angeles. And he was studying the use of peyote on the part of Mexican uh, shamans. And he had an encounter which became an apprenticeship with Don Juan Matus, uh, which is the, um, the, the pseudonym uh, that he uses for his spiritual teacher in his books. So he wrote his first book, which was The Teaching of Don Juan, 
which became quite famous and started to popularize the practice of shamanism in the Western world, as I said, in the United States first, and then it became quite popular even beyond the United States. And this happened um, around the, the 70s, so the 1970s. So, of course, even the uh, cultural movement that was going around at that time was quite favorable to the sharing of uh, that kind of knowledge and the popularization of um, shamanism and these uh, novels, these works on, on shamanism. Then around the 80s, another anthropologist, a more, uh, I'd say, a more established anthropologist because Carlos Castaneda only did his PhD and that was it. Whereas uh, Michael Harner uh, not only did he um, complete his PhD, but he was also, he um, had quite a long career uh, in academia and quite a few publications. And he did do field work as well, especially in the Ecuadorian Amazon with two, mainly two indigenous peoples, which were the Conibo and the Jivaro. So these two peoples, uh, then he also studied other forms of indigenous shamanism from other uh, parts of the world, but not uh, as, not directly, not doing field work. And what he thought to have realized was that across different forms of shamanism, there is actually a common pattern something which he described as core principles, which you find across all different forms of indigenous shamanism. So he basically created um, a new tradition of Western shamanism, which is called core shamanism. Um, and, it, it, and, the, and he also founded the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, which is based upon the idea that there are these core principles across all different shamanism which go beyond the cultural belonging and and these core principles can therefore be applied and practiced and endorsed even by westerners and he actually believed that by doing so westerners could have bettered their lives and get more in touch with themselves and with um nature and uh, basically perform the shamanic journey to obtain knowledge and power as they say and healing of course so um, that's basically how shamanism got popularized in the western world through the works of carlos castaneda first and through the works and um, the tradition of course shamanism by michael harner if we look at Italy, which is, of course, my example from my fieldwork, but uh, I know from uh, other colleagues that it's pretty similar across Europe, um, because we, uh, with Graham Harvey and other colleagues, we published recently a book called Indigenizing Movements in Europe. Um, and yeah, there's a chapter uh, written by me on uh, the Italian version of this. Uh, so, yeah, um, what we find in Europe then is either forms of shamanism which may be described as transcultural. By transcultural shamanism, I mean either forms of shamanism which were born in the Western world, like those inspired by Carlos Castaneda and core shamanism by Michael Harner, or kind of uh, eclectic versions of core shamanism. Uh, because it sort of set out um, uh, a, a model for Westerners to practice shamanism. Or, in, so transcultural shamanism can be either uh, these forms, uh, which are based on uh, Castaneda and Michael Harner, or they can be imported and reinterpreted forms of, of indigenous shamanism. So uh, sometimes you can find um, Andean shamanism or Siberian shamanism. So Westerners who practice this kind of traditions, but of course, since they are doing so in their own context, in their own cultural context and in their own place of uh, birth or the place they live, they have to reinterpret this kind of tradition to, the, to adapt them to their culture and the place where they live. 
So, um, yeah, we have this as transcultural shamanism, and then we have the indigenous or autochthonous uh, forms of shamanism, which are the forms of shamanism which belong to the place where um, the, the, the people live, basically. So, for example, Andean shamanism practiced by people in the Andes and um, Siberian shamanism practiced by Siberians. Does it make sense so far? Does any of you have any question? Hello? Uh, it's pretty difficult for me to see the chat. Can you please uh, uh, seek out loud your questions? Maybe one at a time. I can't see any indication of uh, people asking questions, Angela. Um, but it may make it easier for you if people have got a question, if they've just raised their hand. But maybe if they uh, don't have their mic on, maybe you cannot see their hand. I'm not. I'm not sure. Actually. No, you can, if, No, if you raise your hand, uh, they can be unmuted. Oh, okay. And it looks like you're all okay at the moment. You've got um, a question from Tammy who says, "What do you think of places like Rhythmia have on shamanic practices today?" Pardon. Hang on. Hi there. Sorry. Um, there's a place in um, Costa Rica and it's called Rhythmia and they do ayahuasca holidays where there are shamans in that area. So it's like a five-star hotel but with shamans and People go to take ayahuasca for however long they're there. Some people can take it for four days. Some people could stay for two weeks. So I'm just wondering what you think of places like that that have shamans, but it's a, uh, you know what I mean? Yes, I, I know mean. exactly what you mean. Yeah. Uh, I think it, it is. Um, kind of in line with what I defined as transcultural shamanism in that, okay. um, yeah, some people, there are actually some scholars, I avoided um, the term, but they call it neo-shamanism instead of transcultural shamanism. I, I avoid neo-shamanism because I, I know it can have negative connotations. Um, but yeah, uh, neo-shamanism or transcultural shamanism um, since it is practiced by people who do not belong to that culture, uh, sometimes has certain differences from uh, the indigenous forms of shamanism. And one of these differences is uh, called fast spirituality, which means that uh, you do workshops and shamanic training over the weekend, which happens, um, I mean, quite a lot, uh, if not in in most circumstances, you have uh, this kind of shamanic training or shamanic workshops which occur over a weekend. So even people who are busy with work, um, they can go there and have uh, some sort of training into certain shamanic techniques. So I do kind of equate this. I mean, it is quite similar to doing specific trips in order to experience, to, to have experiences with ayahuasca or peyote or even just experiences with indigenous shamans. So it is part of that um, transcultural um, approach to shamanism. So it's like you are, for example, a British person, but you want to have a taste of shamanism. So you go on a weekend to get a training or you go to um, yeah, Siberia or Costa Rica to, to have an experience with, a, with an indigenous shamanism. 
to, to, to with an indigenous shaman. Uh, either way, it is um, sort of um, stepping out your cultural belonging and entering into a different culture. And when this happens on the part of Westerners, often what, it, what this means is that uh, there's kind of um, an overlap of certain Western expectations and Western categories over very different uh, cult cultural ways of doing that kind of thing. Yeah, so, the cultural like philosophy of doing this, the, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Did I answer your question? Yeah, 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 no, very much, very much, because um, I've watched a few documentaries on it and I've always found it strange that someone who can just take ayahuasca, go on an ayahuasca holiday for a week, is now a shaman. And to me, it's like reading Carlos Castaneda. You have to, it's not, you're not there just for a weekend. It's, you know, it's like doing your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is quite a shamanic training. <laughs> yeah, you know. In including death and rebirth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll let you know when I get rebirth because now okay. I'm... <laughs> Straight into the bed. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions so far? Nice quote from Kevin. Yeah, having all the fishing gear doesn't make you a fisherman. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's also fair to say at this point that uh, in core shamanism, uh, which is the uh, most popular form of transcultural shamanism um, in, in the Western world, they say that you cannot call yourself a shaman, that you can only say that you are a shamanic practitioner. And they say this um, according to what my informants have said, um, appointed teachers by the, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies in Italy, they told me that it is out of respect for indigenous shamans, so they do realize that there is a difference between, um, well, some of them do realize that, and others have a different idea. Um, so there are some practitioners who feel that they are doing pretty much the same as um, a shaman from the Ecuadorian Amazon would do, because the techniques are believed to be the same. And even though the context varies, um, they still believe that they're pretty much doing the same thing. But the official uh, version from uh, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies and from Core Shamanism is that as a practitioner of Core Shamanism, you cannot say that you are a shaman. You can only say that you are a shamanic practitioner out of respect and acknowledgement that um, what we do in the Western world with different modalities and different um, contexts um, makes uh, makes a difference. And yeah, so it is important to highlight that and not everybody um, believes they are shamans after uh, a weekend of training. Although in my um, uh, field work, I've seen that many have this kind of, there is this kind of trend that they become teachers very soon after just a few workshops that they have undertaken. Yes. So it is a trend that I have seen recurring over and over. So that I can uh, report, yes. Thank you so much. Is there any other question? No, everybody seems to look happy. Okay. Yeah, another thing I can uh, talk to you about is the differences that have been highlighted in literature between indig indigenous shamanism and uh, the transcultural version, transcultural forms of shamanism, uh, otherwise uh, called neo-shamanism, which is, as I said, a label that uh, I don't prefer, but it is used in literature and that's why I'm... Um, I'm mentioning it. So the, this kind of differences between indigenous shamanism and the transcultural forms of shamanism which occur 
and are increasing and are getting increasingly popular in the Western world are the first one is universalization, which means that uh, the practice is considered is kind of decontextualized. So it is believed that either you perform a ritual in England or in Italy or in a country in Africa, you are supposed to get the same exact results. So there isn't, there's this kind of idea, this universalization, which is, uh, which is not something that you would normally find in um, forms of indigenous shamanism, because in that case, the performer matters, the, uh, maybe the astrological conditions matter, the place where you, the, the specific place, the specific location where you perform the ritual matters, everything matters and might affect the result. Whereas the model that has been imported in the Western world kind of has, according to scholarship, they highlight this uh, universalization aspect, which means that whatever and however and whomever performs the ritual, since it is the technique uh, what matters the most, you're supposed to get the same exact results. And this is something that I talk about in a publication of mine, which is called uh, Scientism and Post-Truth to Underlying Paradigms in Italian Shamanism or something like that. And um, yeah, it is something that you find uh, quite, it is quite common to find this idea. And I think that this is due to our Western, um, the way, our knowledge is built, uh, so to speak. So um, since we are so imbued with a certain kind of science and we have a certain idea of what is real and what is not real, we tend to have this kind of scientific and scientific rather than scientific, a scientific approach to reality where only something is measurable and repeatable it can be deemed true. So as a consequence, what you see is that even when, when people are practicing shamanism, since they are still embedded in this kind of culture and in this kind of ontology where things are considered real only if they are repeatable and measurable and somewhat resemble natural science and its methodology, people tend to want that in shamanism too. So they want a set of techniques which are going to work quickly if possible, and they are supposed to get the same results regardless of, the, of other conditions which might not uh, be considered measurables uh, to take uh, into account and into the equation. Then another aspect that is uh, related to this is um, called psychologizing in literature and it means that it tends to the element of psychology is quite over, over it's quite emphasized in um, this kind of transcultural forms of shamanism practice in the western world because um, there is quite often uh, for example if you look at works by Sandra Ingerman and of course I do have a few examples from uh, the Italian context, but there are certain forms of uh, neo-shamanism or transcultural shamanism, which are mm, somewhat forms of psychology, uh, like an extended form of psychology, psychotherapy even in some cases, where they try and include elements from, sh from the shamanic worldview even in this case, interpreted in a Western perspective. And also another, another element which is uh, reported in literature, which we find in, uh, in Western shamanism as opposed to indigenous shamanism, is called sanitizing, which means that all the dangers and hazardous aspects uh, and uh, trials and uh, rituals which are performed in indigenous shamanism tend to be eliminated. They, they tend to be just uh, dismissed and uh, of course discouraged. So for example, the use of uh, entheogens and hallucinogens 
or even well there are some indigenous shamans which would leave you in a cave for weeks without food and water and you have to survive and or there are there are very um dangerous we may say rituals which um occur in diff across different forms of indigenous shamanism of, of course they vary depending on uh the the kind of indigenous shamanism but it is quite a common thing to see very dangerous practices and rituals which the person has to endure we may say in order to become a shaman and these are not present at all in the um, uh, transcultural western version mm. so this is called this is normally called sanitizing which means that uh, it's made it's shamanism made um safe <laughs> We may say so. Sort of fluffy shamanism. <laughs> well, I, I'm avoiding judgmental <laughs> terms, but um, it, it is to make it safe. Like, for example, I have uh, undertaken a few um, training uh, in core shamanism. Across my four years of field work, actually, I've been with indigenous shamans and uh, transcultural shamanism, core shamans. So... I've can, uh, I have been um, a participant observer in a wider array of uh, practices. Um, and yeah, for example, what I've seen is that when you undertake a training, a workshop uh, by the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, they make you sign um, a form where um, basically you have to acknowledge that what they are teaching you is not a substitute for the um, traditional medicine. And yeah, uh, I, I found it interesting because yeah, it, it is kind, it is, I think, um, a way of safeguarding themselves from possible, yeah, yeah. legal actions. So yeah, it, it, it was quite clear through it all that uh, there was a very strong safety aspect, which I wouldn't expect to find uh, among the indigenous shamans. Because mm -hmm. during these years of fieldwork, I've also been in uh, Argentina, and uh, I'm also connected to uh, the Mapuche shamans. So yeah, I, I do have you know experiences from different um forms of shamanism yeah. and yeah it is interesting to see um how they differ but also i want to highlight that i don't want to um mine what i'm saying is not meant to be although it may seem so it's not meant to be a criticism of transcultural shamanism i think that transcultural shamanism has a value in and of itself um, mm. I also think that it is important to highlight certain traits which are uh, clearly different from one form of shamanism to another. So what kind of bugs me is when um, transcultural shamans claim to be, claim to do exactly the same thing which an Andean shaman um, mm. would do in, in the forest. Or These are things that, yeah. I don't like. But. Angela, I see this one picture. Uh, sorry, one question. Is shape shifting part of shaman shamanism, and how do they achieve it? Yes, shape shifting is part of shamanism, but uh, that is not something that I found in my uh, in my in the field work that I conducted. So I don't really have uh, a direct experience from it. But I know that my, my supervisor, Susan Owen, um, has worked with, um, with uh, indigenous tradition, which uh, were also performing this kind of shape shifting. But it's not something that I've come across in my, in my research. They, I do know uh, from uh, reading literature that there is this component. And let me think. There is an Italian shaman, because something that I haven't mentioned is that 
although this may open quite the debate. Uh, one of the theses in my thesis, <laughs> one of the main arguments in my thesis is that um, there can also be forms of indigenous shamanism in the Western world. And um, yeah, and the, there was, during my field work, I have encountered a form of vernacular healing, which in my research, I argue to be a form of indigenous Italian shamanism. Um, yeah, and we can go into details on that if, you, if you'd like, but th this was just a premise to say that I encountered this woman in the countryside uh, around Turin, and I've spent a few days with her, um, with her and her family. And she uh, was into shape-shifting. That's why I, yeah, uh, I recalled this experience because uh, otherwise it wasn't something that I really came across much. But yeah, she was talking about certain rituals where uh, she would shape-shift into her uh, animal guide and to her spirit guide and well, um, her, I, I didn't witness uh, any of that. I didn't participate in a ritual where there was shape shifting, but um, I have reports from uh, people who have participated in rituals performed by this Italian shaman. And they said that they literally saw the person morphing into that animal. Uh, but That's I, amazing. yeah. Uh, I didn't personally attend that. Um, the only thing that came close to that was uh, an experience with um, core shamanism when it was overnight and there was a bonfire and we were uh, supposed to embody, it was like there was an outer circle of people who would play uh, drums and rattles and the inner circle would be of people who had to embody the spirit guides that they had met during the shamanic journeys we had performed during the day the, the, that specific day and so and, and then of course uh, we switch places so if at first you were in the inner circle then on the second round you would be playing the drums and the rattles and the other half of the group would be at the center doing this kind of ritual and on that occasion uh, there were people who started to behave as the animals. So, um, like for example, you, you could tell that there were people who had seen in their shamanic journeys a bird and they would start like uh, moving like a bird or people who um, had seen a serpent and they would slither. And so it was, uh, but I, I didn't, actually see them transforming into that specific animal, just behaving and sort of embodying through gestures and dances that specific animal that they had encountered in the shamanic journey. So I only have reports from other, uh, from informants who participated in the rituals performed from, by this Italian shaman, um, and she strongly claims that her tradition is uh, Indi indigenous Italian shamanism. Um, yeah, so there, there are reports of these kind of things. Uh, um, yeah, what was the question again? Sorry, Vivi. <laughs> I'm not actually... <laughs> the question was, is shape-shifting part of shamanism? Yes, and how so it, the answer is yes. And how is this achieved? How and is I this achieved? I think the question is referring to, is this a physical change or is it a change in the mind as a result of ingestion of infusions or whatever that allows the person to believe they have shape-shifted? Oh, that's, a, to... that's a very interesting question and I do have the answer to that. <laughs> well, uh, or at least I can try. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I guess that the question itself sort of implies a Western understanding of shape-shifting. Uh, so, because we tend to, as I explained earlier, we have a certain way of constructing reality as Westerners and to see what is real and what is not real. So, 
uh, and what is the mind and what is outside of the mind. So in there are forms of, sh of indigenous shamanism, of course, it, it depends on the tradition, but um, I, to generalize, I can say that, like for example, drawing on my experience with this Mapuche shaman, um, the idea is that there is there isn't really a separation between what occurs in the mind and what occurs outside of the mind. The way reality is experienced is through a very different lens when it comes to uh, these uh, types of shamanism. So it's not really my mind doing something and something which is uh, an experiences which are outside of it. It's more um, entering an altered state of consciousness whereby you do enter a different state of reality. Castaneda calls it non-ordinary reality. So it is a way for you to pierce inside this non-ordinary reality. In other cases, they describe it as maybe in a similar way as Buddhists describe enlightenment, I guess. So the idea is not that you have to enter a specific place or enter a specific mindset, but it is more like waking up to a state of reality where those kind of things are ontologically possible. So does it make sense? <laughs> yes, thank you. That does make sense. If it doesn't, just tell me. I... <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I'm not sure if Tammy had a question or if she was twitching. Yes, she does. But I can't unmute her. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Sorry. I've Hi. got another one because it's a fascinating subject, but not just necessarily um, just the shamanism point but being Italian did you have any um, <clears throat> uh, interactions with uh, the Strega? Blast. I was going to ask the same question. Oh, were you? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well that's yeah. my question. Yeah uh, yes I actually have a, a video on my channel called um, maybe a bit yeah, in, with a, a very snappy title like uh, the real Strega tradition, the real Strega tradition. Yeah, yeah, Strega. Um, yes, uh, Strega in Italian or Strega if you're from the north or Strega if you're from the south as I am. <laughs> is, is it a word, it's a word for a witch, is it not? It's like witch. Yes, uh, yeah. Strega is the word for witch. And yeah, um, it, it became, I think it's quite popular among uh, Italo-Americans um, because they try to um, sort of find the strega tradition, as they call it, or stregeria, which was um, a Wiccan-based form of um, witchcraft, which um, claimed to have roots in Italian traditions. But yeah, in Italy, strega just means witch. So it's, there isn't really a strega tradition. But there are lots of vernacular witches, which I have studied um, a lot in my research. And as I said, uh, a specific tradition within Italian witchcraft is what I have defined and explained why I have defined in my PhD as the indigenous uh, Italian shamanism because this is a, a, a centuries old tradition of vernacular healers which you find in the countryside, even in the cities, but it's more common in the countryside. And they have these specific gestures which are called segnature. And um, these segnature are practiced across Italy, but it's like every region has a specific uh, specialization, we may say. So like in Campania, my home region, um, the, these vernacular witches tend to uh, cast or remove the evil eye, 
and the evil eye is perceived in broad terms like for example even a persistent headache may be seen as the evil eye and by performing this kind of signatura they would heal your um your headache for example there are other regions where they cure sprains or and also there are specific terms for certain Ill illnesses like there's the santentoni spire and um, i have to think of the translation because of course in my mind it's only italian but yeah there are a set of illnesses which are uh, healed and cured by these vernacular healers which are very used to be very concealed and they didn't really say anything about what they were doing there were traditionally one for each town and it's like it's the, the kind of thing that everybody knows of but they wouldn't openly say oh that's the witch of the town no it wasn't like that but it was like oh there's the woman who will cure your strain go to her there's mm. the woman who you know, who cures the, the herpes and things like that so these would be the um, the more traditional form of Italian witchcraft, which you uh, find uh, still across Italy. And of course now uh, there are certain things which have changed and especially thanks to the internet. Um, yeah, a lot of things have changed, but it has been present for uh, centuries and it is still there. It is kind of an underground religious practice. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know, but apparently I know a couple who are two people that have say that they practice it. Oh, the Italian witchcraft? The strega. Are they Americans? Uh, no, English. <laughs> English. Is there Jennifer as well? Oh, yeah. Hi Jennifer. Hi. Thank you for being here. <laughs> okay. Two questions. I think they're connected actually. Um, the first one you were saying very rightly about this totally different way of looking at the world between Westerners and Indigenous practitioners uh, and that our dualism, I suppose, even, even amongst um, shamanistic practices in the West where we divide things into what is real and what isn't real in a way that a lot of other, most other cultures actually don't. Uh, and I, my first question is whether the fact that core practitioners in Western Europe have this distinction is making a difference, do you think, to what they experience and how they experience um, shamanism? And the other question, which is, connected to that I think when you were talking about the sanitization and the removal of danger from from core shamanism whether um, whether that is restricted to the practices or whether it's also connected to what people experience so for example in indigenous shamanism what people encounter is very often terrifying and genuinely dangerous Whereas in core shamanism, very often what is, certainly in a lot of cases, what is presented is in terms of self-development and reconnection with the other in a way that is entirely positive and helpful. And I just wondered if you'd come across in your research anything, any comments about how the different ways of looking at things, the different world, world views, influence what people are actually experiencing. So the first question is whether the different way of approaching reality on the part of Westerners will affect uh, the shamanic experience, wasn't it? Whether, whether the, um, the different world view, the different view of what constitutes reality, whether that is affecting how they're experiencing the shamanism. Yes, the answer to that, I think it's yes. Um, because uh, of course the way uh, you construct your world is uh, going to affect the way you experience aka construct your practice uh, because everything that we mm, ab absorb and experience needs to enter a certain framework so if the framework we have as a worldview is very much different or is of a certain kind uh, 
um, that will reflect on how the experience will be perceived. In that time, I'm really Kantian. <laughs> so the idea that um, the reality in and of itself is the only reality we can perceive is through our senses and through our perception, through our worldview. So yes, I think that um, it is always an, a relation between our experience and the framework that we allow the experience to be absorbed and um, understood into. So yeah, I think it's kind of unavoidable um, that this would affect um, their practice. What was this, the second question? The second question was really um, a case of whether whether what people are experiencing in the West is usually presented as something that is very positive and very safe. And I'm not talking about the mechanics of uh, shamanism. I'm talking about what people actually experience while they're journeying. That in the West, not always, but very often, it's presented as self-development and it's presented as something that's very positive and safe and that people should be doing to reconnect with the other. Whereas in indigenous practice, mm as I understand it and from what I've read, very often what people are encountering are things that are very dangerous uh, and that they need to be trained to deal with. And I just wondered if that was your experience as well of the difference between core shamanism and indigenous shamanism. Yes, and this is actually a difference. Yes, thank you for that question because it uh, allows me to uh, say something about my field work. Uh, so, yeah, like, for example, in core shamanism, which is the epitome of transcultural shamanism and the most popular form of transcultural shamanism in the West, they openly said during the um, training that I've undertaken that um, it is safe to do shamanic journey. So, because there were people, there were about 30 participants or so, and there were some people who were scared before their first or second shamanic journey that something bad might have happened. And the teacher um, reassured everybody that what you will encounter, the spirits you will encounter during your shamanic journeys will only be positive um, ones and will only give you um, positive experiences, it won't be dangerous uh, by in any sort of way. So um, it is, uh, so I, I can safely say <laughs> that that is the point of view of course shamanism because they literally said it um, up front and uh, during the lecturing part of the um, training slash workshop. And this was also one of the arguments by uh, one of the Italian shamans who I have uh, had uh, experiences with because she uh, claims to be the last Italian shaman of an hereditary tradition and uh, what she told me was that um, when she was 16 her grandmother she's from the south but now she lives in the north uh, her grandmother uh, basically brought her into the woods and left her at 16 alone for weeks and she and tied to a tree and she had to menstruate and defecate on herself and she was without food and water and uh, she said that uh, eventually she was able to untie herself and she had to encounter the uh, all the, um, uh, the the animals and the beasts in the surrounding area and she had to survive that and um, yeah, she said that it was a, an intentional way of dehumanizing, which was part of her initiation. And when she was explaining that to me, she, was, she felt really strongly against <laughs> core shamanism and forms of transcultural shamanism. And one of the things she kept saying to me while I was at hers was that uh, it is not the same uh, to imagine a cave and being in a cave or even being left alone in a cave with your thoughts and your uh, shadows and uh, everything that will um, surface from your mind and all your fears and um, yeah she 
she explained to me how her initiation worked and it was really terrible and dangerous and yeah eventually she was able to untie herself and you know, she didn't even find her grandmother to welcome her but there were a few other people who brought her um, to a certain place to do other um, other things uh, which were part of her initiation process so yeah I guess that even in the Italian case we may say that the difference in terms of the danger the danger of certain practices versus the safety or how safe certain practices are made um, it is present when you compare forms of indigenous shamanism if we accept my uh, way of labeling these practices and uh, transcultural shamanism which are both present according to me in Italy <laughs> so even in in that case you can see that there's quite a different and this was not the only report because then I was able to um, had encounters and uh, do interviews with other Italian shamans and they reported very similar um, struggles and some of them even said that they uh, were uh, on the edge of dying almost before they um, became shamans and they got granted certain gifts so yeah i guess the, the difference is really there thanks thank you for that um i'm not sure if the it's a comment or a question, um, but it says personal, mental and emotional state before entering the journey will produce some kind of risk for trauma, surely, e.g. unlocking repressed memories, etc. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I'm not sure what uh, he or she means. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right, I'll, I'll say. Surely Thank that you. if you have a certain mental state, emotional state, depression, any kind of situation before you go into the journey, that would obviously unlock for lots of things in the mind. Could that, you know, if you've got anything repressed, that will come back. It's, it's sort of follow on to your the previous question in that there are dangers. You may have things repressed, but not aware. You go in, experience them, and it's bad for you. That not that sort of the kind of dangers you were sort of talking about? Um, do you mean when I was uh, talking about indigenous shamanism or the transcultural Western forms of shamanism? Well, the fact that the Western one's saying it's all safe. But that's assuming the person going in is in a good position mentally and emotionally to do so. Uh, so, yeah, if we're talking about uh, core shamanism, they think that um, the first thing that they will uh, make you do is um, a journey to the lower world to encounter your spirit guide. So they believe that when you have retrieved your spirit guide, then uh, all the other journeys would be safe because that spirit guide would um, sort of protect you along the way. Um, they never really mention this this kind of thing that you are mentioning, Kevin. So the idea that perhaps if you have a certain mental health condition that might affect your journey. Because there were, like, I, I'm trying to remember my field work and there were a few people who were coming from a place of trauma. Like I do remember, I do remember distinctively um, an, attend an attendee who had recently lost her, um, her son. And yeah, she was sort of uh, trying to, um, I guess, also seek comfort in trying this uh, shamanic experience. But yeah, nobody, when, when she openly talked about it, uh, nobody really mentioned any possible danger coming from that. 
So yeah, either I have not encountered it or it's left unknowledged, um, unknowledged. Or maybe they just honestly believe that um, the kind of shamanic journeys you do according to the core shamanic techniques do not really present any form of risk, uh, even when you are in a certain state. Unless you were asking my point of view, <laughs> I'm replying from the core shamanic point of view. Um. It, it's, well, it's worth saying as well, just briefly there, that within, shaman, within shamanism, it may well not be, um, certainly the core shamanic courses, there are places, I mean, from my tradition, which is Obod, um, the Order of Bards, Obates and Druids, in their material, well, well, they don't call it shamanism, but there's quite a lot of shamanistic practice in there, and certainly meditative techniques. And there is something right at the beginning of that that warns against doing that if you have any sort of mental disorder or history of extreme depression or trauma, there are actually warnings in there. So at least it is acknowledged as something that is a potential danger. Yeah, in uh, my altered state, I've been using altered states since a child and any kind of, when I'm in a very bad place, it's it's made far worse because I'm doing stuff internally and those that I've sort of coached a little bit who said well can I use this to help remove um, depression and so on and I've sort of said mm, try try other means first you need to get a bit better in placing your head before you can sort of work that way perhaps with the indigenous it's a completely different experience to the Western forms, um, you know, the, the Neo stuff. So yeah, th th there's a difference between the two, I think on that regards. I'm trying to think as a core shamanic practitioner or a transcultural practitioner. I guess that in that kind of, um, in, I mean, if you were um, in a place where you couldn't, journey yourself they would say that you have lost part of your soul and so somebody would help you by performing a soul retrieval ritual and by doing so they uh, believe that they may help you heal from that mental state and that mental condition so sometimes they don't work just on their own but um, collaborating with other practitioners uh, and they perform shamanic rituals together and this will help in case you have an issue of this sort. I do underst I did undertake um, a, a training which was an advanced training on the um, extraction technique and we were paired so it was the idea was you are not able to see what's wrong with your body so there's somebody else you have to work with and we were working in pairs and each one was working on the other to both identify what was um, wrong in terms of health and to uh, yeah help the healing of uh, of the other person so this applies also from when, when it comes to mental health issues and in that case, I guess it might be more a case that a transcultural practitioner will resort to uh, soul retrieval because they believe that when you have trauma, it means that part of your soul has been lost and is stuck in the place when the trauma occurred. And this is something that you find also in indigenous shamanism. So, yeah. Maybe in the neo-shamanism, it tends to be more psychologized and there's more of a psychological component to it. But the idea is pretty much the same. So that if you have mental health issues, they think you have lost part of your soul. And that part of your soul has to be retrieved in order for you to be whole again. And once you are whole again, then you will not um, experience those kind of states, mental states anymore. Okay, Angela, yeah, that's, that's lovely. Out. Thank you. Okay, folks, uh, we've reached, well, we've slightly exceeded our time for this session.
Angela, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. I uh, hope that was uh, explanatory enough. Certainly not exhaustive, but... No, no, obviously. Um, if people have got any questions for you that they haven't come up with so far, I think I've got a note of your YouTube thing as uh, www.youtube.com forward slash Angela Symposium. Yes, even if you search for Angela Symposium, you will find it. Okay, there's also, thank you so much. There's Sorry? also an interview to Jennifer <laughs> on Druid Ray, <laughs> which is quite <laughs> popular on my channel. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you once again, and thank you, all of you, for attending, and uh, your valuable input. And we shall love you and leave you until the next session. Yeah. Thank you very thank much. You very, thank you for inviting me. It was, it was lovely to be here. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Julie. Bye.